oh, sure. Yeah, I can do it. One more thing. One more thing. Just one more thing. And that's our attitude. I can, I can tolerate sleep deprivation. I can tolerate food deprivation. I can go 10 hours or 12 hours without going to the bathroom. And, and, and that's what we're supposed to be able to do. And I got to tell you, we can't, but we're supposed to act like we can. And that's the big conceit of emergency medicine. I could go on and on, but I think you're getting the picture of what it's like. Brian, thank you for coming on. I, I really appreciate it. And welcome to the Rio Talks podcast. Con plaisir. <laughs> How does a day in the life of an emergency physician look like? Uh, a day in the life of the emergency physician um, is not consistent. It, it's, it, you know, it may start at uh, six o'clock in the morning. It may start at uh, four in the afternoon. It might start uh, at eight or nine o'clock in the evening, depending on what shift you do. It can be a Monday, it can be a Saturday or a Sunday. So, so the first thing you have to accept in your life is that it becomes very inconsistent. It's consistently inconsistent. And uh, you give up the idea that you work during the days and you, and you have dinner and you're with your families during the nights. And if you work a lot of shifts, you will be away from your family from, for, for significant chunks of time. They'll be, you know, you'll be having dinner with them and you'll be having dinner with the extended family and you've got a casino shift at 9 p.m., which means that now, of course, in, in, in Spain, I'm guessing, you know, you're starting to have dinner at eight o'clock in the evening. But let's just say we start to have dinner at six or six thirty, round about seven thirty or eight. I got to go. I got to say goodbye. And, and I can tell you that my wife, Tamara, will tell you that that um, that in the hours before my shift. I have a gathering anxiety and I still have it after nearly 40 years of emergency medicine that I'm going to make a mistake that I'm going to arrive and I'm going to be too sleepy or, and that, and that I'm going to, my body's going to be saying, I want to slow down and I'm going to have to speed up. And, and uh, you know, this, you know, experience tells me that after, you know, a few minutes of being on duty as long, I like, I think for me, the worst thing, some people might say this is the best thing, for, but for me, the worst thing would be to take a, my first step onto the emergency department for a shift and have, have, have the loudspeaker, have the intercom go, Dr. Goldman, Teresa, stack. That is not the way I want to start a shift because, because I'm not necessarily mentally prepared. Now, I have colleagues who will sit in the basement, you know, in the change room for an hour to prepare themselves for the shift. So, and that helps because you've got to center yourself. You've got to clear yourself of, of the garbage, you know, the arguments you've had with your spouse. That's not garbage, but all of the emotional turmoil, not garbage, turmoil mm -hmm. that might be getting in the way of you focusing on your job. And then you go and you do your job. Now, I, I, invariably, after the first few minutes, I'm okay. But until I'm there, I have this internal doubt that this is going to be the time when I'm going to be unmasked as a failure and everybody's going to know Goldman can't do this job. He never could. He's an imposter. And, and, uh, and so, and so, you know, that's, that's part of my mental mindset. Now, the difference between me and other people, uh, I think a lot of other people might say he's crazy, but I'm not. I articulate what a lot of people are thinking but don't are but are afraid to say because in the culture of of medicine and in the culture of emergency medicine we tend to not like we we tend to to want to sound like we're supermen and superwomen and super neither super like super he super she super non-binary super they it doesn't matter that we can cope with any problem and and Every new committee, you know, Goldman, you're perfect for that community, that new committee, that new project, that new pilot project. Oh, sure. Yeah, I can do it. One more thing. One more thing. Just one more thing. And that's our attitude. I can, I can tolerate sleep deprivation. I can tolerate food deprivation. I can go 10 hours or 12 hours without going to the bathroom. And, and, and that's what we're supposed to be able to do. And I got to tell you, we can't, but we're supposed to act like we can. And that's, the big conceit of emergency medicine. I could go on and on, but I think you're getting the picture of what it's like. When did you realize that this was something shared within the medical community, this quest to 
to always appear perfect. When did you realize that this, this was actually a problem? Um, I would say that I realized it somewhere around the time that I started to talk about medical mistakes that I made. Um, because, um, you know, the thing about mistakes is that you tend to make them alone. You tend to feel as if you know, they're not. Medical mistakes are almost always mistakes that are, that are, you know, remember the Swiss cheese, the slices of Swiss cheese that represent different opportunities to mitigate the damage. And, and it's only if the holes line up in the Swiss cheese that from the first, from the first mistake to the injury that you get an injury uh, to a patient that, that, that may be, that may be grievous and horrible and changes lives. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the, for a long time, I felt as if I was the only one who made mistakes. Then I started to talk about them and people would come up to me. You know, I did a TED talk, doctors make mistakes. Can we talk about that? And you can read, there are hundreds of comments of people who've made mistakes. I've had people who have said, I was in a hotel room and I was thinking of ending my life. I was thinking of, of harming myself. And I saw your TED talk and I realized I wasn't the only one who makes mistakes. And, 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 you know, slowly but surely, as I talked about it, I came to realize that I'm not the only one. I also started doing a radio show, White Coat Black Art. I'm still doing it. And on that show, one of the first things I did was to stick a microphone in front of people, colleagues, emergency physicians, and, and, and other healthcare providers, and said, this was my worst mistake, blah, blah, blah. How about yours? And, and watch the look on their face. They would, they would look like the microphone was a gun. <laughs> And, and but after a moment, they would start to talk because they wanted to talk. People don't want to keep this inside. Instinctively, you know that your salvation is to talk about your mistakes because you learn that you're not alone. And, and, and in sharing them, you teach other people. So they learn from your mistakes and you begin the process of paying it forward. Hmm. And I'm curious, your, your coping mechanism obviously involves telling other people so that they don't commit the same mistakes. Is there anything else that you do to cope with mistakes that you've previously made? Yeah. Well, so, so, you know, there was a time when I didn't cope and, and, and then I did. So, so the difference between then and now is that, is that in the past I was shame based. I was based, you know, so my reaction was, was that of a person who was prone to shame. And being, you know, I'm not the only one. I think a lot of healthcare providers are shame based. And I think that's one of the reasons why they become healthcare providers because, because they are in a, a job, an occupation, a profession, a calling that allows them to do many good works. Uh, and, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot different from, you know, from other occupations that have a reputation for taking advantage of customers, for instance. Well, well, you know, there isn't, you know, we don't, we tend to have this view of health professionals that they're guided by ethical precepts and that they're nice and they always want to help and they're always empathic. That's not always true because they're human. Um, and, and I can imagine, therefore, healthcare providers becoming healthcare people to assuage their sense of or relieve their sense of shame that they don't belong, that, that they are unworthy of love and acceptance unless they're perfectionistic, unless they're always perfect and they never make a mistake. They live in fear that, they're, that, that should their mistakes be found out, discovered by others, that they will be seen as shameful, that they will be excluded from the group. They will be told, get out of here, get out. And I'm saying it in an angry tone of voice. Get out of here. That's their fear. And they're going to slink away with shame. When you're in that state of mind, you don't want to talk about your mistakes. You don't want to share them because you're terrified of being discovered. Because to be discovered is to experience a form of death, personal death. That's how I used to be. And I realized at a certain point in my life, as shame prone as I am, that I had two choices. I could either die of shame or I could talk about the things that make me feel ashamed and, and in doing so deprive them of the, of the anoxia, you know, the vacuum that allows shame to flourish. And, and, and when you do that, 
you begin to shift away from shame towards guilt. Shame, when you're in the state of shame, you say, I am bad. And you don't want people to know about it. You don't want to talk about it. You don't want to learn from it. You're afraid that if a family discovers what you did, that it's the end. When you shift to guilt, you switch from I am bad to I did bad. I'm a good person. I just, I had a lapse or I didn't think it through or I was tired or sleep deprived. And in that state of guilt, you want to apologize. You want to pay it forward. You want to teach others about it. You want to learn from it. And you want to work with families to make, to make things better. And so I shifted. And in shifting, then I discovered that I could talk about it. But the most important thing you have to do is share it. Begin by sharing it with someone you trust. Someone who, when I say you trust, you trust them to, to listen intently, to see you as you are, and to still accept you, to say, you're still okay. That's what people want to hear when they share their darkest memories of the medical mistakes that they made. That, that, I've heard your mistake. You're still a good doctor. You're still a good nurse or pharmacist or physiotherapist. You made a mistake, but you're still, you're still okay. And, and, and you can learn from it and you can, you can be somebody who teaches other people how not to make that mistake. And you know what? Down the road, somebody's not going to make that mistake because of you. So this is how your quest about voicing your thoughts about the medical community, community started. And then how did you go from this, from voicing your mistakes to now talking about empathy and kindness? And something that really surprised me was that medical professionals were a lot more, I don't know if a lot, but more empathetic at the beginning of their career than in the fourth year. Why does that happen? And how did you make that shift from voicing your mistakes to now empathy? That's a really interesting long journey. And, and you're quite right. You know, if you look at the Jefferson scale of physician empathy, there have been studies now done in different populations of, of medical students around the world, paramedics, nurses, other healthcare providers, dentists. And what they have found is you're quite correct. Your highest empathy score is, is at the beginning of your first year of medical school and your lowest is as you graduate. What's happened? Well, a number of things have happened. You're under stress, constant stress. You're sleep deprived. You're food deprived. You are, you, you, you might well have experienced some trauma. You might have witnessed trauma. You may be suffering from compassion fatigue. You may also have experienced moral distress. So compassion fatigue is, is what happens when you have heard the same awful story so many times that it no longer has an impact on you. It's the hundredth time. This family is telling you, you know, it's in front of you and, and you've, you know, and, and they've lost a child in a car accident or to sepsis, uh, or to COVID, you know, in the, in the, in the current uh, frame. And, and for them, it's, it's the one and only time and it's the worst thing that will ever happen and it will scar that family forever. And for you, it's the hundredth time or the fiftieth time you've heard this conversation and it just doesn't have an impact on you. So that's, that's compassion fatigue. The other thing that happens is, is moral distress, where you go into medical school full of ideas, idealistic ideas of how patients are supposed to be treated, and then you encounter a system that doesn't deliver what you think they're supposed that patients are supposed to receive, or families. Um, you you want to spend an hour with that grieving family, and your attending physician says, got to move on, or your senior resident says, you haven't got time for that, get going. Uh, or you think that you should treat the pain with a stronger pain medication and you have a senior resident or an attending who says, no, nope, you can't, not on my ward, you can't. And they're the boss. And now you have a suffering patient. And apparently, you know, or, or, or for instance, it could be as simple as you think that the attending, like this family has been waiting in the emergency department for seven hours for the surgeon to come. And, and your, and your attending is the surgeon or your senior resident is the surgeon. And there's a part of you that says, get the hell down there and talk to that family. But you can't, because if you do that, you're going to get a bad evaluation and you're going to be identified as a troublemaker. So, so you can't do that. So now you're in a bind and it's moral distress. 
And, and all of these are risk factors for burnout, now called moral injury more, more often, and that gets rid of your empathy. In fact, the higher your level of moral injury, the lower your level of empathy. The higher your level of sleep deprivation and stress, the lower your level of empathy. The more you've been bullied, the lower your level of empathy. And so there are many, many reasons. And then there's the system forcing you to do five things at once, uh, forcing you to keep learning new passwords, refresh your password. It's, it's, it's all exhausting work, the clerical work that's involved in processing patients, uh, trying to make a system work. And all of that is robbing you of empathy. So I'm not at all surprised that at the end of, of medical school, your empathy is at a low ebb. But the question you asked is, well, well how did I get mine back? Something happens sometimes in mid-career. And in my case, I got accused of a fit by a family of being unkind. Hmm. And that got me more than being told you're an idiot or you're incompetent. Because if a family says you're incompetent, they heard there's a doctor in the family or a nurse or some other healthcare provider who said, I think Goldman screwed up. But you know what? That's not proof of negligence. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I can come up with, with 20 other people who will say, nah, they, they don't know what they're talking about. But if they say you're unkind, I think everybody <laughs> kind of knows what unkind is. And so that's what set me on the journey. But I happened to be receptive to it because I had begun to unpack the shame that I felt about medical mistakes. The other thing about shame is that the higher your level of shame, your low, the lower your level of empathy. They're, they're inversely related. And so as my shame levels began to drop, my empathy went up because I was no longer afraid of, of talking to patients that they were going to say, you, you know, you're a killer. You know, I, I suddenly became, I began to like people again. And, and you know what? Patients and families are starving for healthcare providers who like being around patients, who just like people. And if you just project, if you smile and look like you like being around people, they're going to love you because they don't see enough of that in healthcare. And I can go on and on talking about that, but that's the journey I had to make. I had to kind of dig out and unpack my personality and reveal the four-year-old, the three-year-old boy who was considered a breath of fresh air. And somehow it got lost along the way and I had to rediscover it. Wow. I didn't know, like... Us seeing it from the other side, you see the doctor rushing left and right, and then he doesn't really spend that much time with you, and you might feel like, oh, wow, you might feel a little bit, you know, you might feel that lack of empathy, but knowing how the system works and all that you guys have to go through, I just can't imagine how you guys, after all of this, still muster up the courage and muster up that empathy within you after all that time of uh, not sleeping seeing patients left and right lose their family their family members it's just incredible you know it's it's interesting that early in your career um because of the, the extreme stresses the fact that as a resident as a student you're being judged constantly that that it's not hard to see patients and families as the enemy because you're always in a hurry And the patient who wants more of your time, it's a zero-sum game. Eventually, the, the, the time they take is going to have to come from something. And there's a good chance it's going to come from either other patients or uh, first. No, first it's going to come from you. First it's going to come from your need for sleep. It's going to come from your need for a pee break. It's going to come from your need for food. And you're going to find that you're almost martyring yourself for your patients. And then it's going to come from other patients and that's going to make you feel worse. And, and, and you're not going to know how angry you are inside that you're being, that you're going through these, the, the series of deprivations, physical, emotional, uh, and, 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 and cognitive and, 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 you know, if, if you don't, and, and I can tell you that the most important thing you need to do is take care of yourself. But, You know, I can say boundaries, you know, and we, we talk about, you know, I'm sure you've got it in your, in your, uh, in your list of, of criteria of professionalism, respect boundaries. And boundaries doesn't just mean the boundaries between doctor and patient. It also means learning to say no when you're overtaxed. Well, you know, what if you have an attending or who, who, or a culture that says 
you can't take an hour off to get some extra rest. You're not allowed to do that. Even though the rules say you're supposed to be allowed to do that, you're really not. The culture says you can't, and you'll get a lousy evaluation, or maybe you won't get a lousy evaluation, but this group won't want to hire you as an attending later on because you're too selfish. And taking care of yourself is seen as selfish. You know, uh, the first thing that has to happen is you have to get into your own practice. You have to get past residency when you're being judged. So you're no longer being judged. You feel a sense of security that you're not going to get fired or that, that, that you're not living and breathing according to your next evaluation. That you that, that from once you're out in practice, you're evaluating yourself. You know, you're, you're, you're your biggest judge. Once you get to that point and you have more control, you may have more time to, to take care of yourself and therefore to empathize with yourself. Not everybody does. A lot of people um, continue to martyr themselves, continue to give themselves over to everybody else but themselves. And when you do that, you're setting yourself up to lose empathy and be and to suffer from moral injury in mid-career that might even make you want to think about quitting. Hmm. And we're talking about empathy a lot, but before researching you, I didn't know that there was different kinds of empathy. Now, now it makes sense because if you literally feel what a patient is feeling, then you're probably going to feel bad the rest of the day. So what are these different types of empathy and what do you recommend people try to cultivate? So there are, you're, you're quite right. Uh, you know, there are really, there's, there's about three or four different kinds of, of empathy. You know, they've been, they've been kind of thin sliced into, into either three or five, but the, the most important three are, first of all, as you said, affective or emotional empathy and cognitive empathy. Those are the most important two. Affective or emotional empathy is a mother, for instance, or a father. You know, I don't have to be sexist about this, uh, you know, but a parent who is feeling the pain of their child who's screaming, who's getting, who's getting uh, local anesthetic before getting stitches or does or, or is, is, is terrified of being confined. And, and, you know, and people who are listening to this, there's a hashtag, it doesn't have to hurt. So there are ways of addressing pain in kids. You know, it, it, it's not a rite of passage that every procedure is supposed to leave them screaming in pain. It, 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 it doesn't have to hurt. But, but as a parent, you may be feeling the distress of your, of, your, of your child. And that's because you identify with them. And that's because of a, a chemical, you know, a hormone called oxytocin. And that, that is the foundation of attachment, without which we wouldn't attach to our kids. As you've already said, um, it would be paralyzing to feel the pain of our patients. And, and, uh, and so we don't encourage affective or emotional empathy. In fact, if it happens, it, 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 it will happen because somehow there's something about that story of that patient that you identify with. And, and you know, for instance, I'm thinking of a paramedic who developed PTSD after attending a young woman who died from a random act of violence. And he and the, the, the seeds of that PTSD came from the fact that for a moment when he attended her, he thought she was his fiance. Wow. So he, he completely identified with being a grieving lover, a grieving fiance. And, and if we had that intensity of emotional attachment, we would not be able to function. The only reason I'm mentioning this is that we don't encourage it. It sometimes happens spontaneously. You can't help it. You look at a patient and it could be my grandfather or grandmother, could be my parents, could be my sibling. And so, and so if that happens, recognize that you may be so overly involved emotionally that you don't know where you end and the patient begins. And you can't make objective decisions. You can't think objectively about them because, because you're compromised by identification with them in a different way. In that case, you may actually have to step out and let someone else look after them. So get that out of the way. What we're talking about is cognitive empathy, which is the ability to imagine what it's like to be somebody else. And that is a practice ability. Some people are born with a better capacity of it than others. It's biological, but it's also a, the product of nurturing. And it can be nurtured. And it can be nurtured as simply as changing places with somebody. 
Um, one of the things that I do in the emergency department, if, if I'm sitting opposite a patient and I'm trying to encourage them to, to get a CT scan of their chest or their abdomen and they're terrified and I know they need that, that's the best test, but they say, doc, you know, I've heard so much about radiation. I just, I can't get that test. You know, I'm so scared of radiation. Um, one of the things that I will do is if I'm talking to them, if I'm giving them facts and figures and, and they are coming back at me with objections and I give them more facts and figures and they're coming back at me with objections, the first thing that I do is if I'm facing them, I, I, I sit beside them. And metaphorically, I, I subtly, without their even realizing it, I've joined them and they've joined me. We're on the same team now, looking out the same horizon. And what I'm trying to do there is to, to imagine what it's like to be them. And, 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 you know, I can, I can do that. You know, there are many ways to do that. Um, one way to do that when I, like, I think a lot of young healthcare providers think that their job is to apologize for delays in the system. So in the emergency department, you know, if it's taking six hours for the surgical resident to see the patient, to get the CT scan report, I know, you know, doc, why is it taking so long? I got to get out of here. Why is it taking so long? And, and, the, and, and I feel it's my job to say, well, you know, we have a triage system and then sometimes the sickest patient moves to the top of the list and they're doing the very best they can. And, and when you do that, um, you're, you're, you're invite, you, you're inviting yourself to be in opposition to the patient. Just say right off the bat, you know what, if I were in your place, that would suck. This whole delay thing just sucks. It's awful. And that'll stop it because, because they realize you're human. And they also, you know, they also realize that, that you see them, you see that they're frustrated and they have every right to be frustrated. And, and, you know, especially when we start to talk down to them and insinuate that they're acting like children grow up or, you know, we don't say that, but we act like that's true. And, and, and we want people to imagine what it's like. And, you know, for instance, we see, I don't know if you, if, if, where you practice, where you, where you're doing your studies, but we have patients, not so much during COVID, but before COVID, who were in the hallways on stretchers for a day or two or three. And sometimes in the United States, borders, they call them would be there for five days. Can you imagine what it would be like to live on a stretcher for five days in a nightgown, you know, in a hospital gown with two bathrooms for 40 patients uh, and, and no privacy and the intrusion of, of people walking by making loud conversations? You know, imagine if you are sitting on that gurney waiting for the surgeon to tell you if you've got cancer or not, what the biopsy showed, and, and suddenly three nurses go by or three doctors say, so what are you doing this weekend? Well, we're going to a movie. Oh, I'm going to the soccer match. And, 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 and how would you feel? So you can see that if you practice it, it's not difficult to imagine what it's like to be your patient. When you imagine that, it doesn't govern how you act, but it informs how you act. And you can learn that with just simple practice. And, and, and you know, I've learned how to do it. And the good news is that we are hardwired to do that. We're able to do that. Um, we shut it down uh, for a whole bunch of the reasons that I talked about, stress and sleep deprivation and time crunch and, and you know, attendings and, and senior residents who don't give us the time to, to, to do the things we need to do. Maybe we feel angry because we're hungry and tired and sleep deprived and we haven't had fun for a long time and, and we're just suffering. So there are a whole bunch of reasons why that's the case. So that, so. First empathy is affective empathy. The second, we don't want that cognitive empathy we want because it helps us. And the third empathy is, is actually called compassionate empathy, but it's also known as effective concern, which is the motivation to want to help other people. To get up and go, to run to the fire, to the resuscitation room, instead of running away from it. And, and we want people to have that. So your appreciation of somebody's plight by being able to empathize with them propels you to want to help them. And, and, you know, people go into medicine wanting to do that. And by the time they get out of medical school, uh, they, that, that may have been decreased. Um, but, but the way to bring it back is to take care of yourself. Take care of yourself first. Uh, as you gain more control over your working life, 
you're as you're able to achieve more balance between between your work and 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 taking care of yourself hopefully you're able to bring that into balance and your and your natural tendency to be concerned about others and want to help them will come back talking about natural tendencies and that everyone is wired for empathy there's also these exceptions like narcissists psychopaths sociopaths machiavellians and what can these people do how do we know if uh, we are or somebody we know falls into one of these these groups well um it's that can be hard to to distinguish you know i, I think somebody who's narcissistic um might be a little easier to detect just because you know they seem totally self-absorbed but i mean you know, i think we've all met you know we've all met colleagues you know classmates who are who appear to be totally self-absorbed and you know we might have this dichotomy where if they are if we see them as superstars you know in the united states somebody who has a great reputation who brings a lot of business to the hospital brings a lot of patients to the hospital generates a lot of revenue um we're going to be very reluctant to cut to 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 cut ties with them uh and and you know there are, if you read my book the power of kindness I, i i spend some time in one chapter talking about successful psychopaths the difference between a successful psychopath and and an unsuccessful one is that the unsuccessful ones end up in jail they're violent criminals they tend to to have a lot of pleasure in making people feel pain um they but but the successful psychopaths uh, are able to 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 avoid skirting the law they might do things that are unethical but they don't they don't commit violent acts in fact they're often averse to violence they are selective in their ability to get along with people so they they know how to curry favor with donors of the hospital or or donors of the orchestra or 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 the company you know the shareholders uh, of of a company uh and while at the same time they may treat the the employees poorly um and and it can take a long time to discover them you know and 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 you know one of the things we know about psychopaths is that they they often have excellent cognitive empathy they can imagine what it's like to be an employee and they know how to push their buttons to 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 arouse a response that makes them feel bad or guilty or want to help and they can manipulate them into buying things that they don't need to buy or to participate in activities that they really should say no to. So uh so it can be very very difficult. The best thing I can tell you about about uh the dark triad of of Machiavellians, narcissists and 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 psychopaths is that they are in the minority. And the vast majority of us are are uh uh on the uh you know on 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 the good side of the empathy spectrum but the the the, the co there's often overlap between the three types machiavellians narcissists and and psychopaths but they all have one common denominator they seem to be incapable of caring about the people there that are around them they care only about themselves and you know i think donald trump is a perfect example of that <laughs> I I I I can't imagine him caring about anything other than himself and that hmm. seems to be his that's the one common denominator throughout all the all the years especially this this you know the 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 nine or so months since the pandemic where he has just been he just you know to him the the deaths are just numbers statistics they're not people real people with 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 parents and children and and brothers and sisters some of them have been decimated by covid-19 Is it possible for for this type of people to cultivate empathy or just the way their brains are wired is it doesn't work? Uh well they they it it doesn't work. They uh they're if you if you do a functional MRI of their of their brains, you're going to discover that the amygdala doesn't light up when it's supposed to, when they're supposed to be demonstrating empathy towards others. They're not mm -hmm. dialing into the suffering of other people. They just aren't. Now can you simulate empathy? There have been experiments using uh intranasal spray administration of oxytocin, which is the kindness chemical, and there are, there may be some benefits to that. These are early days in those in those kinds of studies. Um in addition, um you know, one of the things about about successful psychopaths is that they're not all bad. 
Um, they can cognitively develop an awareness of their own limits or of the danger zones and they can avoid them. Uh, certainly psychopaths who have a college education, so the higher the education they have and the more supportive their families, if their families recognize um, you know, what's up early on, they can help guide them into avoiding their worst impulses. So there, there, is, there are things that can be done. And you know that that successful psychopath might might be somebody who is a genius, and they might be able to to invent things that are very helpful to other people. And maybe you know if they surround themselves with people who can curb their worst impulses, then then maybe they can succeed and be of benefit to society as well. That's a great way to look at it. We, we've been looking at the dark side of the spectrum, but I know that in your book you really focus on kindness and on kind people. You traveled around the world to find the kindest people on earth. I'm curious to know how you went about finding these people and what criteria you use to measure their kindness. I worked with a couple of great researchers because it's hard to scour the world by yourself. And, and uh, you know, I was looking for um, some exceptional acts of kindness extraordinary acts of kindness, you know, because I'm writing a book, I want this, I wanted the stories to jump off the page. And so for instance, I found a woman in her early 30s in Sao Paulo in Brazil, who became soulmate to a man who had lived on the streets of Sao Paulo for for 37 years, 19 of them at, at, a, at a spot not far from her home in Sao Paulo, where she lived with her husband and, and her young son. And, 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 you know, what I wanted to find out was, first of all, what's the act of kindness? What did you do? In her case, it was many acts of kindness. She befriended him. She, she built a Facebook page for him because she's a marketing guru. And eventually that she, he became a local celebrity. And eventually, um, his brother, who he hadn't seen for decades, recognized him and, and, and reunited him with his family. It's a great story, but, but the story was only part of it. I wanted to find out what made that person so kind. And in her case, so, so I spent time with her and I did kind of a deep personality analysis. And what I came up with in her case was that she had, um, first of all, had lived a very lonely existence as a child. She had been the go between between her parents who argued constantly until they divorced when she was 12 years of age. And, and so the father, her father would confide in her about his troubles with her mother and her mother would do the same thing. And, and, you know, imagine a young child having to listen to these stories when they just want to live in a happy household. And, and what, what I learned from her is that she learned how to retreat in those moments when she was deeply traumatized and, and disappointed with life. She could retreat into this world where she could meditate and the world was a perfect place and she could live in the moment. And, and so when she met this homeless man, she discovered a, a soulmate who also lived in exquisite moments, even though he, here he was dirty. She didn't know if it was a man or a woman. He had garments. He lived under the elements. He lived uh, in a, a tent that was made of garbage bags sewn together. And he wore a garment that was made of garbage bags sewn together. And in spite of all that, he was a poet. And he had 10,000 poems and he, and you no, know, he had, well, he had thousands of poems and he had hundreds of books in his tent and he read them. And, and so, and, and she discovered her soulmate. The two of them were mirror images. They learned how to live in the moment and that moment and they empathized with one, one another. And, and when you're in that state, when you can live in the moment, that's when you're able to empathize. So that was her. Um, you know, I met a woman who developed a revolutionary approach to dealing with people who have dementia, who are disoriented by their dementia. It's called validation. Her name is Naomi File, and she learned how to empathize with people who have moderate dementia. Try that one. That's difficult because, because it's hard to know where they are. You know, when they have moderate dementia, they're no longer living in the here and now. They're living sometime in the past. And if you just met them last year, you don't know. They're, they're 90 years old. They may be reliving when they were 70 or 50 or 20 or 10 or when they were three 
and they were traumatized by a parent. And and what she learned is that you can you can extend empathic gestures towards that person. And and even if you don't know what it is that's bothering them, you can empathize or validate their struggle to 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 uh, resolve or revisit what they're feeling. And when you do that, they feel better. They don't know why they feel better, but they're calmer. If they haven't been participating in daily activities, they do. And, you know, they sleep at night. They stop sunsetting. They sleep at night. They're up during the day. So, so, and I learned, so what was Naomi's story? Naomi was born in, in, uh, in Germany. She lived through the first six or seven years of Nazi Germany and escaped with her, with her parents to the United States in 1938. They ended up in a long-term care facility in a nursing home in Cleveland, Ohio. And, um, because they were poor, they had no other place to live. They lived in the nursing home and Naomi developed an attachment to the residents who were living there at the time. Her best friend was 50 years her senior, and they, they partied together, they, they watched movies together, and, and she developed a deep empathy for this woman, and that deep empathy for, for this woman, this resident, propelled her to develop a theory on, on why people with dementia appear to be so agitated as they enter the moderate to late phases of, of it. And, and, you know, I had many stories like that in the book. That's what my book was all about. So, so what was your act of kindness? Her act of kindness was learning how to empathize with people who have dementia. Um, and why did you become empathetic? Was it because you were born that way? Or was it because you learned, was there adverse, an adverse experience in your life that propelled you to become empathetic? And, and, and my idea behind that search around the world was to learn one lesson from everybody from, from one chapter to the next and then summarize all of it at the end. And I, I think it worked out. Correct me if I'm wrong. What I'm understanding is that kindness is rooted in empathy and understanding the other person. Yeah, I think so. You know, and, and it's interesting. Why did I call the book? Why didn't I call it The Power of Empathy? I could have called it that, but, but um, there are lots of books on the, on, the, on the shelf in the bookstore or the library on empathy. Very few on kindness. Hmm. And there was something interesting about kindness. You know, kindness comes from the English, the old English root kind, which refers to, it's the same root as my kind or your kind, mankind, humankind. And what it means is people who are of the same ilk. And, and the act of extending kindness to someone else is it comes from the same root as as understanding that I could be you and you could be me. And I want to help you in the same way I'd want to help myself. And and when we are and that's that's empathy as well. That to, you have to be empathic because you have to know what it's like to or imagine what it's like to be the other person and imagine that they could be like you. That they and and find the commonalities. Why am I like this person? Why is this person like me? And and when you're in that state, you want to help them. You want to extend a gesture of kindness towards that person. So, so that's so to me, the power of kindness was a step up from empathy because it not only includes the perception that you could be that person and they could be you, but it makes you want to do something about it, which is the act of compassion or, or kindness. I've learned so much. I really enjoyed this this talk, and thank you for coming on, Brian. It's been amazing. Is there anything you want to say specifically or anything you want to promote? Yeah, well, a couple of things. So first of all, The Power of Kindness, you know, is, is my most successful book. Um, it has, you know, if, if, if you want to hear it as an audio book in the English language, it was just published by ECW Audiobooks. And, uh, and, and you can listen to me. I, 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 got to, I got to narrate my own book, which was quite a wonderful experience. Uh, and it's just coming out now uh, in, uh, in in as an audiobook. Um, I'm working on a new book called The Power of Teamwork, which is all about the journey from me to we in healthcare and beyond. And and the idea that that you know if you think you work on a team because you work on a group of you work with a group of individuals, well, that's not a team. 
it's something has to happen before before you guys become a team. So that's what I'm working on right now. And uh, and I guess the other thing I want to say is, if you're listening to this, if you're watching this, and you care about learning how to be empathic, you don't have to take a course. In fact, there's no evidence that courses work. What you do need to do is practice self-forgiveness, self-compassion, self-care, practice mindfulness, exercise, eat a proper diet, try to get as much sleep as you can, Try to, to find moments during the day when you just let your brain lie still. Try to, to appreciate the good things in life. In other words, practice gratitude. Uh, be grateful for the things that, you know, notice the little things, the fact that the sun came up, the fact that, that you're alive, you're still alive, or that you can enjoy things, that you can enjoy a meal, that you can enjoy companionship with friends. And, and, but, but if you, if you make a mistake, forgive yourself. If you, if you are going through a bad time, if you, if you said something to somebody and you wish you could take it back, apologize. But the first thing you have to do is forgive yourself. If you do all those things, your natural capacity to be empathic will come back to the surface and, and, and you'll feel better about yourself. And I guess the last thing I want to say is this. Kindness and empathy are not a zero-sum game, where if I'm kind to you, it's at the expense of myself. Not at all. Kindness is an infinitely renewable resource. So is empathy. If you are kind to others, you will feel better. It's so, it's, it, it, you will, your blood pressure will go down. Your heart rate will go down. You'll feel better. And when you are mean to somebody else because you think you've got to save it for yourself, your heart rate will go up, your blood pressure will go up, your level of distress will go up. And I can think of countless examples of, in my own experience, where I walked away after making a snappy comment to somebody and it hurt me more than it hurt them, at least as much, maybe even more. So those are the things I want to leave you with. Thank you so much, Brian. I, I really enjoyed this interview. I hope we can stay in touch and, um, I don't know if you ever need anything in Madrid or Mexico, Miami, let me know. And I think it's great what you're doing and keep, keep it up. My pleasure. And, and, and uh, be kind, be empathetic. Because, you know, if you have to choose between being, between correct and being kind, I would choose kind every time. <laughs>